Good afternoon, everybody. The character of Gideon might not be one that we are totally familiar with. We find uh, Gideon in the book of Judges in the Old Testament, and it's surprising how many people don't read the Old Testament. And they don't realise that there are all these characters and all these stories which are relevant. Because many people think that the only relevance in the Bible is in the New Testament, not realising that the Old Testament is the foundation upon which the New Testament is built. And what we see with um, a lot of the stories uh, within the Bible, within Scripture, is we see recurring patterns. We see things happening in the Old Testament that are repeated in the New Testament. We see things that are happening in the Old Testament that are as relevant today as they were when they were written. So what I'd like to do briefly this afternoon is look at, look at uh, the, the story of, of Gideon. He only actually appears for, for two or three chapters in the book of Judges, and we're not actually going to look at everything anyway. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at um, his calling, and I'd like to, to look at the, the battle that he wins. And I'd just like to draw some lessons from it about God, about how God interacts with his creation, with, with us, and also what God wants for us. And we can see through that through what God wanted from Gideon. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll open our, our, our Bibles in front of us, if you, if you have them, to Judges chapter 6. We, we've just read it together, uh, the, 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 the first 17 verses. But I just want to have a look through and, uh, as I say, draw on a lesson. Uh, just six, six, if you like, six points that we can draw on from... Um, uh, from this, this, this account. Now, if you've got your Bibles open, now I should say this afternoon I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, the quotations on the screen will be from the ESV, but please follow in whatever version you have in front of you, whichever version uh, you're most comfortable with. If you've got Judges chapter 6 uh, open in front of you, just go back to the previous verse, uh, verse 31 of Judges chapter 5, and, and the, effectively it's the, the last half of the verse, and we read... And the land had rest for 40 years. So what we see is at this time in, in the history of Israel, certainly at the end of chapter 5, they were at peace. They, they were safe. The land were, were, was good. All, all was good in the world. When we come to uh, verse 1 of, of uh, chapter 6, it said, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord gave them the hand of Midian for seven years. And the, the lesson, if you like, that we, we learn from this is that God punishes the wicked. Now, some people find that hard. Some people find, well, we're talking about a God of love. How can you say a God of love can punish somebody? Well, if we think about God and, and our relationship with God, if we think back to the Lord's Prayer, what's the first two words of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. God is our father and God and we are his children. Now, if you are a father or a mother or a parent or a grandparent, then you will know that children don't always do what you want them to. And sometimes you have to punish them. Sometimes you have to teach them what's right. Well, that's no different with God. God doesn't punish people because he enjoys it. He punishes them to say... That's not how I want you to behave. Come, come back and behave that way. It's no different to the way that we, that we would hopefully raise our, our children to try and do what's right. So when people say, oh, God, God punishing the wicked, that's not a God of love. It is actually a God of love. It's a God wanting us to do what is right. So what we have in this uh, uh, chapter 6 of Judges is that for 40 years, the, the, the nation of Israel was doing what was right. And they were following God's commandments, and all was good in the world. But then we see the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so then we have, from uh, chapter 1 through to, um, effectively chapter 9, this, this, this account of, of how they, they became under attack from, uh, from the Midianites. And we're introduced to this character, Gideon. And at verse 11... Uh, we go on and it says well verse 11 now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah which belongs to Joash 
the uh, Abaziarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. It seems a very straightforward sort of sentence that it just, we're just being told where Gideon was beating out the wheat, but actually it, it speaks volumes. Because we've just read, as we read in our introductory reading, didn't we, how the fact that whenever uh, the Israelites, they, uh, whenever they, they began uh, beating out the wheat, the Midianites came and stole it from them. They couldn't, they couldn't do things uh, in the open for fear that they would, they would lose their crop. So what we see here is it's said that Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press. He was, he was doing it in secret. He was doing it indoors. Basically, he was afraid. He was afraid of the Midianites. He didn't want them to steal his wheat. So he, he did what he did. And he thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do it uh, indoors. And, and that way, we might actually uh, n uh, not, uh, not lose anything. So actually, he was, he was quite frightened. He wasn't doing it outside. He, he, was, in, he was indoors. But it's interesting that the angel still went to visit him. Because if you think about this on, on our next lesson about Gideon, he doesn't exactly come across as your typical hero, shall we say. The typical person that you would choose to become a great leader, which is ultimately what, what, what he did, what we, what, what we read about in, in, the, in the next two uh, chapters of Judges. So if we carry on, on, on reading through Judges chapter 6, we, uh, so we, we read this to, uh, together. So the angel says to him uh, in verse 12... The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valour. So the angel has seen something in Gideon, even though he is, he is merrily beating the wheat in, 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 in private. He's actually, he says, he's a man of valour. And, and, and Gideon can't quite comprehend this. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us to the hand of Midian. And what we also see here is Gideon questioning God. Gideon saying, why has he let this happen to us? This, you know, this isn't the way it's meant to be. We know these stories about how the, uh, our, our predecessors were brought out from the land of Egypt, how they crossed the Red Sea. Why is God letting us do this? He was questioning God's decision making. But the angel saw something. And our next lesson, if you like, lesson three, we see in, in verse 15. Because, well, the angel goes on to say, but you know, you, are, you will become a, a mighty man. And verse 15, and uh, Gideon said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. What Gideon was saying here was, I'm not the right man for the job. I'm not a man of valour. I, I, I'm not worthy of this role. In fact, he says, you know, my, my clan, his, 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 his sort of subgroup within the tribe of Manasseh, we are the weakest, we are the weakest of the world. You've come to the wrong place. You need to go to some of the more powerful tribes to find your leader. He didn't think he was worthy. But the angel, and ultimately God, saw something in Gideon that he knew that he was worthy. So, at this stage, we've not really got, as I say, our, our, our traditional hero. We have our, he's, he's cowering afraid of what might happen in the world, and he's saying, I'm not worthy to take on this, this role, this responsibility. But God has seen something in him. If we carry on now to um, verse 25, and we've not read this, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this uh, here. It'll be on the screen. I'll say follow it in, in, in a, whatever version you have. But one of the important things that, that Gideon did uh, before, if you like, he, he took on uh, this, this role, he took on this mission, God had said to him, well, the, the first thing you need to do is you need to get your house in order. Because... We've just read, haven't we? Know that the children of Israel were doing everything wrong. We know that they had altars to to the the god Baal, to, to idols. It, it, it was it was not as God wanted. So, verse twenty-five, 
of Judges chapter 6. That night the Lord said to him, to Gideon, Take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of the family and and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So God says to, to, to Gideon, I want you to remove these altars to Baal. Go and destroy these altars to Baal. It makes reference here to, to the Asherah that's beside it. In, my, uh, in the, the notes on my study Bible <clears throat> about Asherah, it says, uh, it may function as both divine name for a particular goddess, or, as in this verse, refers to sacred wooden poles erected at places where she was worshipped. And it lots of references to kings um, and, uh, and Deuteronomy and other occurrences. So... Obviously, by the altar, there was, there was something, whether it was a post, whether it was actually an idol that had been carved, or, or, or whatever it was. Gideon is told, you pull that down, you chop it up, and you use it as firewood to do a real sacrifice to me via the bull, uh, which if we went back into, into the, uh, the law of Moses, into, into uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we'd see was, was part of what the children of Israel should have been doing. So the first thing that he does is, if you like, he puts his house in order. He, he, he distances himself from, from, from the, rest of the, the rest of the world, the rest of the, uh, of, of, of the people, and says, no, that's, this is wrong, I will do what's right. But it's interesting in that last verse, isn't it? He says, but because he was too afraid of his family and of the men of the town to do it, he did it by night. So even though Gideon took that step, he was still worried. He was still afraid. He was still afraid of what people might think. He was still perhaps even afraid to make a stand. He was a bit, he was a bit cautious about the actions that he was actually taking. But he did it. And if we carry on reading, uh, we actually find out that there, 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 was, there, there, uh, there, there, uh, there was some backlash against this. Verse 28. When the men of the town arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the ashram beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said one to another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the man of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore on that day Gideon was called Jerubbabel, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down the altar. Now, in this case, it's actually Gideon's, Gideon's father, Joash, who's, who's, who's making the stand. But he's actually sort of, he's, he's saying, uh, yes, it was Gideon that did it. You might not like it, but that's what he's done. And he does make this interesting the point where they are saying he needs to be put to death because he's broken down Baal's altar. And Joash says, Baal's got a problem with it. Then Baal can come and sort it out knowing full well that Baal couldn't sort it out because Baal was a piece of wood they worshipped that had just been used as a fire so he stood up for himself Joash in this case though elsewhere we'll see Gideon himself he'd he'd committed to this action and he stood up and it might not have been exactly uh, as everybody else thought should be but he was willing to take a stand it could have gone horribly wrong, and sometimes it, it, it does. But he had that commitment and he had that faith to actually make a stand and say, no, this is right. If we carry on now to our, um, 
uh, if you like, almost our, our final lesson. And this is from uh, this is from Judges chapter seven. So we're into the next chapter. I'm not going to read all 25 verses. I just want to read the first uh, the first few, and and then we'll 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 nip to the end, so to speak. But it's an interesting it's an it's a, it interests all, it highlights all sorts of interesting uh, aspects. This this particular uh, account. So verse 7, then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into the hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has, sa has saved me. Well... First of all, what we see here God is recognising is, uh, unfortunately, he's recognising the worst of human nature, which is that we are all very proud of what we can do. So God says to Gideon, actually, there are too many people here. If we go into battle with this number of men and they win, then they'll turn around and say, it's down to our superior army. It's down to our superior tactics. It's basically because we are so much better. But God said, I want to prove that it's me that's in control here and not these people. So we continue to read uh, verse 3 uh, of um, chapter 7. Now therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remain. So there are 32,000 people here, and God gave them a choice. God said to them, you can, you can fight for me, or you can, you can not. Choice is yours. Two thirds of them decided, no thank you, we think we'll go home. Whether it was a lack of faith on them, whether they didn't actually believe that God could, uh, could, could win this battle, or for whatever reason, they decided to turn themselves on, ba on their backs on God. That's two thirds of, the, of, of this of this nation, which was supposedly God's nation, they turned, they turned their back. But God gave them the choice. God gave them the choice, and some of them chose to ignore God and just go their own way. Verse 4. So he's now from 32,000 down to 10,000. This is, this is quite taxing for Gideon as well, because he's probably thinking, I've only got a third of my army now. But anyway, God, God continues, and, and he's not finished. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for, uh, for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone to whom I say, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So what we see here now is God has created, if you like, a selection process. And God has decided who he wants and who he doesn't. The first, the first group, if you like, made their own choice. God is now saying, of these remaining ones, I will choose them. Now, he used a slightly unusual technique, shall we say, but, the, but anyway, it says, verse 5, so he brought the people, Gideon brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set by himself, likewise everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand on the, to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the others go, every man, to this home. So God has now taken them from 10,000 people to 300 God really doesn't want to be able for any of people in Israel to be able to say it was because of our superior manpower. They now have 300. Gideon is probably now thinking, this is suicide. We cannot compete with 300 men. Now, we're not going to look at this, but please, if you want to look at it in your own time, throughout the course of chapter 7, and in fact, I'll also continue into, into chapter 8, effectively, we, we read about the success of Gideon. And at the end of, well, the end of chapter 7, we read, and they, this is, this is Israel, captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. And then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. They chased the Midianites out of their land, and they won. 
And what this showed, and the lesson which Gideon would learn from this, is that whilst on paper, shall we say, the odds were stacked against him, and that it would seem impossible that he could have won with so few men, with God, nothing's impossible. Nothing is impossible for God. So there's six lessons that we've, that we've, we've drawn out of this, of, this, of this story. And the thing is that I said history repeats itself. And throughout the course of scripture, throughout the course of the Old Testament and the New Testament, you will find similar <coughs> themes. The idea of somebody being afraid and saying they're not worthy. Well, actually, prior to this, if you look at the calling of Moses, he had exactly the same argument. And we look at throughout the whole course of, of scripture and these themes are there. And the thing is that these themes are here now in the 21st century. So if we now think about those six, those same six lessons that we just learned from Gideon, but apply them to the modern day, and let's see what we, what we, uh, what we gain from that. So the first thing we said was God punishes the wicked. Now, this is sometimes you've got to be uh, careful how people interpret that, because they, they say uh, some people do have some sort of... Uh, I would say incorrect ideas about when natural disasters happen, they're punishing that, that nation. But God does punish the wicked. Because unfortunately, whether we like to think it or not, we might think that we're all very good people, we might think we're God-fearing people, but ultimately we all die. That is the, the ultimate punishment really, isn't it? We know from, in Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 23, it says, for the, we, the wages of sin is death. We sin... Sin just means that we do things that are not pleasing to God. And because we do that, we die. Now, that wasn't, that wasn't the original plan. Well, we won't look at it th this afternoon, but if you go back to Genesis and you read that when God created the, the earth, he created it, that it to be perfect for people to, to live forever. And it was man who rebelled, if you like, against God. He did what he wanted, and that's why death is introduced. And we still do the same thing. How good, however good we may think we are, we, we still do what's, what's uh, wrong in the eyes of God, and therefore we die. But in the continuation of this verse, we say, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We said before about God being a God of love, even though when he punishes you for doing things that, that are wrong, which I think is perfectly reasonable, because what God has done is he says, well, now this, is, this isn't a permanent situation. I don't want my children, I don't want my creation, I don't want us to die, death to be a permanent thing. And so through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has, he has put in place a process by which we can have eternal life. The next thing we said, Gideon was afraid. Gideon wasn't really a hero. He was afraid of what was happening in the world. Now, I don't know how you feel at the moment as we come to the end of this year, but the world is quite a frightening place. A couple of days ago, even the Queen, in, 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 in her message, was saying about the, 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 the shadow of terrorism. We live in quite a, a, a frightening place, and it can be, it can be a, a worrying time to live in. You may be, have fears for your health. You may have fears for your children or for, for your work. You may not know where exactly you're going to be in, in six months' time. At the moment, if you live near a river, you may fear for your home. There are all sorts of fears that we have. And it's completely natural. It's completely natural that, that we should have fears. Ultimately, I suppose the thing that we fear the most, or the thing that we don't really want to think about, but we know will happen, as we've just said, is that we fear death. So actually, we're all a bit like Gideon. We're all sort of in our wine press, rather hoping that the rest of the world will go away at times. But that's completely natural. And God has said, well, in the one of the, I should say, one of the, the uh, authors of one, one of the Psalms wrote, <coughs> the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? And there are dozens and dozens of other references which talk about the wonderful calmness, if you like, which we can, which we can have knowing that God will look after us. In fact, just turn over me please to uh, Philippians chapter 4 because there's a, there's a lovely um, couple of verses here which again explains about, if you like, the, the, the peace and, and, and the reassurance that, that we can have. Philippians chapter 4. And verse 6, 
the writer says, do not be anxious about anything, but in anything be prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So actually the Bible is full of messages saying, you're afraid, don't be. God is with you. So the third lesson from Gideon. God chose the weakest. Gideon was very much saying, it's not for me this. I'm not worthy of this. I'm from the weakest clan. I'm the worst person that you could choose to actually, to actually un undergo this, this, this task. I am not the right person. <coughs> it didn't matter to God. It didn't matter that, God, that Gideon didn't come from the best tribe, that he had the best background, that he was the most competent, that he, was, that he had all these skills. God called him. And if you find yourself thinking, well, actually, I, uh, you know, I don't... I'd like to, to, to be a disciple of Christ. I'd like to do what's right. But I'm the wrong person. I am not worthy. Well, the simple fact is that none of us are worthy. Yet God still calls us. If we look in, um, again, back to Romans, it said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if we're using that as a barrier to sort of say, well, I don't really think I'm, I'm, I'm up to the, to, to the task then it's not really an argument, because none of us are. And in fact, we know that the eternal life that, that we know that God is, is offering us is a gift. It's by his grace. So, again, as, as, the, as the angel said to Gideon about, it doesn't matter that you come from a lowly tribe, it doesn't matter on our background, or where we come from, it's where we're going to that matters. The next thing that we know that Gideon did was he, he did what was right. We saw how he changed his life, how he, he took down the, the, the altars of Baal, how he, 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 he basically put his life, put his, his house back in order. And in the New Testament, we're instructed to do exactly the same thing. In the, uh, in the book of Acts, we read, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So here, repent, it's, it's a word that simply means to change. Sometimes it's sometimes referred to as being a U-turn. It's meaning that you need to change your ways in the same way as Gideon changed his ways and he, he decided that he was going to turn his back on Baal. We have to do the same. We have to change our ways to try and follow God. Now, whereas in the Gideon's case, God gave him quite explicit instructions about how he had to pull down Baal's altar, he had to burn the Asher and he had to sacrifice a bull. We don't need to do that. Uh, in some respects we sort of do, in as much as that symbolically we do, but in what we are told we need to do is to, to be baptised, which is this um, idea of full immersion, it's this idea of washing away our sins. Exactly the same idea what Gideon had to do, but Gideon, before he could go on, go on that, that path, if you like, he had to change his ways, and then he had to, in his case, make a sacrifice. Our sacrifice has been made through Christ, so therefore we are told to be, to be baptised and to, to continue our walk. Lesson five from Gideon was he stood his ground. What Gideon did was he actually went against the rest of the world. The world was quite content worshipping Baal. The world was quite content carrying on. All, his, all the, the, the other tribes around him, all the nations around him, the whole world thought that the way that they lived their lives, they were quite happy with. And Gideon, and I say we, he was actually his father, stood up and said, no, actually that's not right. This is what we should be doing. And ultimately, if you put your faith in the world, then you put your faith in the world, but it's not going to come to anything. In the same way as Baal was not going to suddenly sort of come and rebuild his, his altar, if we put our faith in the world, then ultimately we will live and we will die in whatever life we have. And it, 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 it's, uh, it's sort of almost immaterial, but he stood his ground. Now, that's a very hard thing for him to do. And if you do the same, if you choose to follow 
Christ, if you choose to change your ways and baptise, you may feel as though sometimes you stand out like a sore thumb. And it's not necessarily always easy. You may think, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, if, you, if you have sort of any faith, particularly Christian faith in the world today, you know, you will be subject to ridicule and you will be uh, subject to people thinking that, you know, you're, you're living in the past. But the, uh, the Apostle Peter wrote, In this you rejoice, though, now, for a little while, if necessary. You have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're told, even when if we do feel as though we're being persecuted or ridiculed, it's only a temporary thing. It's a temporary trial, and ultimately, at Christ's return, it will, it will just be washed away. And we've read already, haven't we, about how with God by our side, there is no need to worry, there is no need to fear. Which takes us on to our, our final lesson. With Gideon, he showed he could do the impossible. He showed he could defeat the Midianites with 300 people. And what God has shown and what we can see in, in, in our, our scripture, ultimately, he raised his son from the dead. We know that and John 5 says, Do not marvel at these things, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the, re to the resurrection of life. We know that he raised Jesus. And we know that if we die before Christ's return, he will raise us. He will raise all those people who have gone before us, who have followed God's instructions. It's impossible, you may say. How can somebody be raised from the dead? How can, 300, how can 300 men fight, uh, overcome all the Midianites? With God, things are not impossible. And sometimes we may read the Bible thinking that's impossible. That's not the case. We see that there are lots of things that God says that which to, to our human minds seem impossible. He talks about this, this kingdom when Christ returns and when, when people will be granted this eternal life. But it's not like the world we live in now. It says here in Isaiah chapter 35, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The world will be transformed. And we may look at that and think, well, particularly when we were talking before about the state with the, with the floods and all that's going on, we think, well, the earth's not right. It's, it's in a... The physical land that we live on is in, is in a bit of a mess at the moment. But this is talking about a completely different, uh, completely different arrangement where there will be no illness, there will be no drought, there will be no famine. It will be perfect. And again, you may think, that's impossible. It's impossible to imagine that. But the final quotation, I think, and I think this is something that we really have to remember, is from Mark chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. So if we find some of this too good to be true, if some of we find some of this very hard to, to believe, if we find ourselves thinking, well, yes, that, that, that may have happened in the Old Testament, but it can't happen to me here today, it can what God did for Gideon seemed impossible. And what he is offering us may seem impossible. But it's not. And God did it for Gideon. And God is willing to do it for you if you just let him. Thank you.